Pastor Jay, please go ahead. Uh, Pastor Madawa. Good evening, everyone. Pastor Madawa, good evening to you. Good evening, Fundisi. Um, All right, let us bow our heads and pray together. Our God, our Father, what in heaven, we want to thank you for affording us this privilege to come together as your children. And Lord, as we have come, we pray that you give us the word that you have prepared for us tonight. Even as we will be joining those who are still to join, our prayer, Father, is that you bless each and every one of us. We pray for the speaker whom you have chosen today. We pray, Lord, that you are able to use him in a powerful way, that when all is said and done, glory and honor will be unto your name. This is my humble prayer tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank Amen. you so much. We want to welcome each one of you um, for making it today in this platform. We want to thank all the members of the trans Orange Conference. We want to thank all the members coming from our sister conferences. And also we want to thank the visitors that we have invited to be with us today. Uh, without any waste of time, we'll just briefly recall uh, yesterday, we had Pastor Hamatanga, who took us through um, a beautiful message, and we want to thank God for him. Yesterday, the pastor spoke to us, and we, 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 we were blessed by his message. Today is no different. We will be having Pastor Chongwe, Dr. Chongwe, who will be leading us through families supporting mission. Families supporting mission, and I pray that the Lord uh, help both you and me to hear what the Lord has in store for us. Um, Pastor Mongwe, over to you. I will still be trying to set up your slide. Just please continue. May God bless you. Thank you for this. I just enjoyed you when you just elevated me to the president of the of the union um calling me pastor shongwe <laughs> good evening everyone we we quite used to that pastor shongwe and i enjoy it sometimes it happens when we are together in an audience and it becomes fun uh, but this is Justice Mongwe. I'm glad today that I can converse with the church on family participating in missions and stewardship. And I think uh, one can almost guess where I would draw my inspiration from. I would like to go to the early church. In the early church, we are told that no one was lacking anything. In, in fact, what it means in my language, it means everyone had everything that everyone had. So there wouldn't have been a situation where uh, there will be the elite in that they have got more money, like it was the case in the church in Corinth, uh, at some stage where there were women who were more dressed, uh, more dressed beauty, beautifully more than others, to the extent that others felt smaller than those that could afford expensive clothing. So we do know that the best description of the early church, which is very clear, it's about the early church, shortly after the Lord had gone back to glory. We find that in Acts chapter 4, or that's where I would like to, to draw 
my reading from. If you are ready, you can share the screen, Funis. But otherwise, I would want us to look at verse 32. Verse 32 says, Acts chapter 4, I will take it from verse 32. It says, and all the believers were one in heart and in mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses, they sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed equally to anyone who had need. Then it tells about another man, and this man is named by name. And I think that is for a reason. It says, and Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he had owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Um, what strikes out very clearly for me then is that we all would love to have belonged to a church like this one, um, where no one feels out of place because everyone wants to lift those that are down there. And as someone has said, the only time we should ever look down upon people, it should be we're looking down at them so that we can be able to stretch our right hand and lift them up. But we do know, my brothers and sisters, that today, instead of cooperating, we are competing. And it is the competition that is killing the work. It is a competition. Uh, sometimes we compete for access even to the pulpit, but we never get to compete, to be at the table of service where we serve others. And with the early church, what we do know from this reading is that they all put an effort in making sure that those that had less than what others had, they were covered so that poverty had no room in that space. So we're talking about communalism, where everybody owned everything together, or where everybody didn't lack what the others had. And for me, this is an ideal church I would wish to live in. This past Sabbath, I was sharing, it was a bit on a lighter note, but I was talking about how we may, as a denomination be great when it comes to giving to us the work of God. We may not be the greatest amongst the Christian family worldwide um, that are great at supporting the Lord's work with our means. And I was saying part of what I've seen is when I go out there now comparing our congregations in this beautiful country of ours with Adventist congregations out there. This is not a scientific study, but what I found is that what I experience when I, I go to serve in other countries, I see people giving generously to us camp meetings, making sure camp meetings happen. People give Helpfully towards the cost of um, camp meetings, and I find us down here fighting, saying, "Ah, oh, this this um, this goal, our contribution allocated to us is too huge, and we have all the questions 
written in big English, just so that we get excused from giving to us the cause of the work of God. And this is not what we see when we see we visit other um, Adventist communities, especially outside our country. In, and I'm referring mainly not to Western congregations, but to congregations in Africa. We have seen our brothers and sisters to the point that they will give until there will be staff left. They, they will give more than the budget requires. And I was trying to encourage my brothers and sisters in the congregation where I was um, serving to say, we need to learn to give and giving my brothers and sisters if we are going to get to that point where we give sufficiently to us the mission of God, we are going to realize that there is giving first comes from a heart that is filled with contentment, with appreciation. When we are filled with gratitude for what God gives to us, we are then able to feel content and contentment goes together with peace. And when we are at peace, we are less anxious. And Jesus says, do not be anxious about tomorrow. He didn't say don't plan about tomorrow, but he does say do not be anxious about tomorrow. So we, I find us to be more overwhelmed by concerns about tomorrow and fail to realize that what God, what we prayed for, give us this day our daily bread. We have failed to see that God has indeed given us as families and as individuals our daily bread. That's why we can afford certain things. That's why we live in comfort. He has given us our day-to-day -day bread. But after we have seen him provide for us, we don't feel secure enough. We want to lock the money in the bank. We want to lock it up in the investments. And we want to hire security guards to guard over us and our wealth. Whereas we know that he that watches over a city watches it in vain except the Lord be the one who watches the sitting. And I am picking on the passage that I've picked on, specifically to say this is possible. The Bible says that no one lacked in the household of faith because those who had the means, they shared the means with the church for the propagation of the work of God. But to the extent that everybody and the work propagated, we, we um, prospered. We know that the hands of the apostles, for instance, were freed so that they could concentrate on full-time missionary work. They didn't have to go and work where, where they, the mission work was supported. And we can do that even today. We can be able to support the growth of the mission of the church by having um, hearts that are interested, that are committed to giving. But before we would have the giving heart, we must have the heart that knows who the greatest giver is. And that being God, this has been said over and over again, that the greatest gift that he gave was the life of his son, Jesus Christ. And if we know that the, even the material things that we have, they are as a result of God's providences. Put in um, the language of, um, of David, he says in chapter 23, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, he's my provider, he takes me to green pastures. He causes me to lie by the still water. So if we were to recognize that what we have, the means that we have is God's providences, 
we wouldn't be overly anxious about tomorrow. We would not fear that we may become um, poor because we have given to us the cause of God. In fact, the promise of the word of God in Haggai 1 and the promise of God in Malachi 3 is that when we become open-fisted, open-handed with the gifts that he has bestowed upon us, he promised to give us more. He, <laughs> I like the, the, the figure of speech that is the metaphor that is used in Haggai 1. It says, oh, you, you gather wealth, you gather your wages, and it's like you put your wages into pockets that has got holes because you have left my house in Tatars and you live in beautiful houses yourselves. So, and God says, I'm not impressed about that. And I'm not going to, to show favor until you have supported my house. At the same time, God is saying, I can live in houses built by human hands. There's no house that can contain me. Which to me means when he gives us a privilege, for instance, to build him a church building, it is a privilege. When he allows us to participate in the spreading of the gospel, it is a privilege. Because I heard him say somewhere, if you shut up, these rocks, will rise, rise, they, they're going to rise up and say the worship and they bring the glory and honor to my name. God doesn't need us. We need him. And he says, but I can take care of you. Check me out and see if I will not open the windows of heaven to take care of you. And God has never asked us to give from our poverty or our having nothing. He asks us to give from what he has already given us. When in the book of First Chronicles, I think it's 29, when David looks at what he had given to us, the building of the temple of God, um, he gave so much. And he says, as he says, a prayer um, of praise to God and worship. In that prayer, he says, who am I that I should pretend to be giving to you? I can't give to you because all that I have given to you is what you placed in my hand in the first instance. And all that your people have brought in here, it's because you first placed it in their hands. And the people had given to us the project of the building of the temple. By the way, which David was not going to build. It was going to be built by his son Solomon. So David was bringing his means to further the work of God without looking for a chance to shine. Because the one who was going to build that temple and with its glory and splendor was going to be Solomon. And he says, look at your people, God. You have given them stuff. That's why you, you, when your spirit moves in them to give, they give this much. What have you seen in us? We really do not have anything of ourselves to offer. So I propose to my brothers and sisters all over you must first, if you want to give joyfully, and God prefers um, a grateful and a cheerful heart that gives to us the cause of his work. If you want to get to that point, first recognize that you didn't pull yourself against all of, you didn't lift yourself up with your own boot strings. It is the providences of Jehovah. And where the stuff that you have today came from, from the throne room of God, there is still more right then. And God can sustain you and me. We will never get poorer because we gave to us the mission of the church or to us the work of God. It is a privilege. 
Now, as I wind up, I want us to look at the next chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, Pastor Madaba, if we can now move to chapter 5. Oh, by the way, go back with me to chapter 4, verse, the last verse. The, it just kills me, this one. Yeah, that one about Joseph, uh, verse 36. It says Joseph was a Levite, meaning he was a, a servant of the Lord. And it says he was from Cyprus. I believe that should be Greek. Greece, and he, whom the apostles had nicknamed the son of encouragement. Oh, how I would like that kind of a nickname. The good, the thing that we know, all of us, is that our names of, of that we given at birth by our parents. Quite often, they show the experiences they were having then, or the aspirations they have. Um, they would say Bexisa, Begumuzi, uh, and so on. Um, but nicknames we are given by people who know us most, not at home. They, these are the people who know us when we have removed the mask and we are our very selves. And the nickname that they give us actually means it describes how they experience us. And the apostles experienced Joseph as, a, as an epitome of encouragement. If you were in Joseph's company, you will not leave his company still feeling low and dejected. He was good at encouraging people. Now verse 20, 37 says, and he had land and he sold the land and brought all of that money, the proceeds of the sale, to the Lord's church and put it at the apostles' feet, not paying the apostles, but for the furtherance of the missions of God's church. And I thank God that even ministers who might be an equivalent of, of um, Levites today, we also have been given the opportunity and the privilege to support God's work, not only with our knowledge having come from seminaries, but also with our means. We are expected to tithe. We are expected to give offerings. We are expected to also grab the opportunity to support God's work with our means. And Joseph did just that. And he brought it to where um, I've had people saying, what is, what is a storehouse? I wonder where the confusion is. But <laughs> Joseph had no con confusion in his mind. He knew where to take it to. For me, the storehouse, it's where there is the center for the furtherance of the mission of God's church worldwide. Without, because that's the commission that we have been given. But let's move to the next family and see how it did this. Chapter five from verse one, Acts chapter five, and we take it from verse one. Then the Bible says, there was a man named Ananias together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Let's move to verse two. And they brought the, with his wife's full knowledge, they kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Before I find a problem with this couple, let me appreciate the fact that when they reflected on what they were seeing happening at church, God's people participating in supporting the means of, uh, with their means supporting the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They took note that there were families that were supporting the mission of the church with their means. They would convert their houses or their, or their lands into cash 
so that it will be easy to distribute it and so that it can be easy for the cash to be used where the need is the most. Um, and when Ananias and Sapphira saw this, they admired it. And they went back home and they, with, uh, with mutual consultation, they made a decision that they were going to also, like the rest of the church couples and the church families and the individuals that were in the church as described in chapter four, they wanted to be like them. And the principle I, principle I appreciate the most here is verse 2 tells us that his wife was fully, Ananias' wife was fully aware. Oh, how I wish that our pillow talks could be about how we can push God's work forward um, more than the other things that do not help anyone and are not of the quality of the kingdom of God um, that occupies our pillow talk time. This couple went and made plans on how they would participate. Of course, there was something a bit amiss about this, which I want us to learn as families to, to make sure we do not repeat the mistake of this family. The Bible says his wife had a full knowledge that um, his, her husband had kept back part of the proceed of the sale of their property. And this, again, <laughs> shows how they, they were transparent to each other. How I wish that the wife called the husband to order. My prayer these days will be, I mean, for us these days will be that husband and wife or families must encourage and challenge each other to participate and participate in the right way in the furtherance of the Lord's work. We should not, one, an individual should not let their partner get this thing wrong in their presence. Safira should not have permitted. We nowhere do we hear that she tried to persuade husband and Ananias to misrepresent the facts as they stood. So I ask that we shouldn't, I'll use a pedestrian name, a street name, don't go to heaven alone when you could go with your spouse. Pastor Rotondo? Yes, you can go ahead, Murut. We, we can go ahead now. So I would wish for us to, as families, not to allow any, and I'm not talking about the use of force here. I am referring to not in my name, not in my present, will this family fail to fully support the work of God. Safira should have been able to persuade the husband. You see, what was happening here is the people like Joseph and others, they sold what they had and um, turned it into cash and brought it to the church. But there was no rule about this. Ananas and Sapphira could have measured their strength and sold the property they had and made a decision of how much they were going to take to support God's work. But what they did, they sold the land, and the Bible says here, Ananias, the man of the house, kept back a portion of that, the proceed of that sale. And his wife was aware of that, and she didn't lift a finger, not even a pinky. 
And then she, Ananas takes a portion to the church. And can we move to the next two verses? And gives the impression or the report that they too have sold the land and these is the pro the, are the proceeds from the sale of that land without disclosing that they held back a portion. And verse three says, then Peter said, and my brothers and sisters, what is being said by Peter here should have been said by Safira, the wife, because she was the first to be privy to her spouse misrepresenting the facts when it comes to their attitude towards supporting God's work. So Peter says to Ananias, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? So this was the issue that Ananias brought the money in the pretext that it was the complete, that's what he got from selling the land. Um, and Peter keenly rebuked him. One, he says, those thoughts that you have, they are the thoughts of Satan who has taken residence in your heart. Many of us, truth be told, the church may be what it is today because we do have some folks whose hearts are occupied by Satan and they do come to church. And sometimes they are popular and they are distinguished members of the church, but in their, their hearts are filled. Uh, maybe let's pass that. It is just so, so uncomfortable. And he further tells Ananias that he didn't lie to the human being who cannot see the heart. He says, Ananias has lied to the Holy Spirit. This is like telling heaven a lie and you think you can get away with it. You can lie to heaven because heaven is so aware of you. God is so aware of you. So this was a grievous mistake. And I am saying this rebuke here that we are finding being made by Peter, we ought to remember that it should have been made by his spouse. Families need to stick with each other and make sure that as much as possible as a family, they do this jointly and they do it right. He asked a logical question. Whilst the land was yours, was it, did you have to sell the land? And if you decided to sell the land, why didn't you keep all the money? You know, why did you put yourself onto the highway to the gates of hell? For the what? And I think some of us may need this kind of a stern rebuke, my brothers and sisters, because we are so preoccupied with the appearance and we do not have the experience of true godliness. So there are some who bring a false tithe, for instance, and I'm, I'm not here to speak about tithe, but I'm just giving an example. They'll label an envelope as tithe 10,000, and yet they know that it's not a tenth of their, of their profit um, or of their income. Uh, somebody on a lighter note again, somebody says, ah, you know God can reduce you. If you can give 100,000 when he has given you a million, he can reduce you to so that that 10,000 will become your true tithe. Uh, if you can handle God's floodgates being opened towards you. But my plea today will be that as families, let's encourage each other. Let's be transparent with each other so that where we're getting it wrong, other family members. I've been corrected by my children when at the robot 
uh, the beggar is asking for a coin and I say, I don't have money. And they have said, daddy, but there's money on the ashtray right there. And sometimes they've taken the money and given it out. And I appreciate that I would have the children that can rebuke me when I misrepresent what God has done for me and make it look like God has not done much in my life to the point that I cannot give a beggar who's obviously struggling. Um, and I say I'm as broke as the beggar is. And I'm grateful for my children. And I'd like it that every, in our families, every member may hold hands with the other and together we give to us the cause of God. And we do so joyfully, we do so cheerfully and see if indeed he will not close up the holes in our pockets. Many of us listening to this message today know how much, how often it has happened that they made much money. And before they knew it, they don't know what they've done with that money and the money is gone and they don't have anything to point to. That metaphor of getting wages, putting them in the pocket that has got holes. But when God is your guide, you know, and you do it with the right spirit, you know that the God of the green pastures of David will still be God of the valleys. And David says, even when I'm to walk through the dark valleys of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because your rod and your staff, they strengthen me. So when we know it's God with us throughout the way, we are doing fine, and I urge all of us to join hands in supporting God's work. And until he comes, may God's grace be upon each one of the listeners today and help us as families supporting the work of God. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mongwe, for such a powerful presentation that calls all the family members to join hands even as they advance the mission of the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for each one of us who was able to come and join us tonight. Uh, we are also inviting you to come through tomorrow. We are also reminding you that the presentations will be shared in all different TOC platforms so that you can have access to them. We also want to remind you that tomorrow uh, the 29th of August, we will have uh, Pastor Hamatanga. Pastor Hamatanga was with us yesterday. We will have him again come and present pastor, partnering rather uh, with God, with our resources. How do we come to God to partner with him and bring our resources? I pray that we all will be able to come and hear what the Lord has in store for us. Uh, we will ask uh, my brother here, for fear of butchering his name, we will ask him to pray. Um, I will unmute him and he will pray for us. Okay, let, let us pray. Uh, our kind and merciful Father in heaven, we come before your throne of mercy and grace this evening. Thank you, Father, for you've been with us uh, during uh, the pre presentation that was before us. Father, may you help us that we remember to give back unto you cheerfully and joyfully. And Father, thank you for reminding us that we have to do it as a family. May you bless each and every family and remind us again that we need to offer to you as families. Father, may you help us to be transparent to you and help us that we may not be like Ananias and Sapphira. Father, after all is said and done, may glory and honor be given unto your name. And Father, may you help us that we are able to provide for your mission to go forward. We pray that now as we are going to sleep, you may protect us during the night until we see the next day. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. May God bless you and may he keep you 
and cause his face to shine upon you until we meet again. Amen. Amen.